uh, with Marvin, it, it, there's no delicate. Uh, you just have a conversation. He is a performer at heart. He loved telling his story. He loved telling the high points and bragging about how he would score 50 points a game with his eyes closed and the low points about how his goal in life was to be a pimp and a drug dealer and to live fast and die young. And he told them with uh, equal exuberance uh, and uh, no apologies. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, it's Tim Hanlon. Indeed, this is Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that's focused on what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for joining me, as always. Today, we're talking about basketball, pro basketball, American Basketball Association basketball, the ABA, with uh, our guest today, Dan Forer, who is the uh, director and the producer of the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary from uh, 2013 called Free Spirits, which is uh, focused on the uh, uh, short-lived um, ride of the St. Louis Spirits, or as they were officially known, the Spirits of St. Louis uh, from 74 to 76, I believe it was. And um, uh, some great stories coming up from uh, from Dan Forer, who is also uh, timely uh, for us uh, because he also is the producer and director of a brand new film that uh, if you're listening in, in late April, when we drop this episode, uh, is debuting in a world premiere fashion. His uh, new documentary called Mike and the Mad Dog, all about Mike Francesa and Chris Mad Dog Russo, the uh, dynamic duo in uh, New York City sports radio uh, that in many respects actually birthed uh, a new format for radio uh, in this country. Uh, They have since separated professionally, but uh, who knows if they get back together again. But Mike uh, and uh, Chris Russo are uh, very much uh, uh, established in the firmament of, uh, of sports talk in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, nationally as well. And uh, it's the, the film about them called Mike and the Mad Dog is out there uh, at the Tribeca Film Festival in late April and will be on ESPN proper and the various platforms of ESPN sometime uh, this summer, we think maybe sometime in July. Uh, and uh, you'll probably know that by now when you, if you're listening to this show. So Dan Forer is our guest coming up in uh, just a second. Quick uh, uh, shout out to everybody who has uh, sent all kinds of great commentary and uh, and attaboys to us uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, please indeed follow us on social media. On Twitter, you'll find us at goodseatsstill. That's at goodseatsstill. Uh, you will find us on Instagram at goodseatsstillavailable. Uh, we have a Facebook Facebook page, if you can say it properly, uh, about uh, the show as well. And um, if you want to send us email or sign up for our newsletter, all that kind of stuff, go to the website. Again, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Thank you uh, a ton for listening. Thank you a ton for uh, giving us uh, some uh, shot of adrenaline as we uh, continue to stumble our way through uh, this adventure together. So thank you. Okay, let's uh, not waste any more time. Let's uh, hit the pause button on me and uh, start up the conversation we had just a few days ago with Dan Forer here on the show. Why are you interested in the spirits? Well, uh, I uh, I think the first good question, I believe, would be why were you interested in the spirits enough to make a uh, really cool documentary about it for uh, the ESPN 30 for 30 project? Uh, I was actually approached by ESPN and asked if I knew anything about the ABA. And I told them I did, that I was a fan of the LA Stars and the Anaheim Amigos. And they asked me if I was at all familiar with the spirits of St. Louis. And I said, you mean Bad News Barnes and the gang? And they said, yes. And they asked me to submit a proposal. I think they were looking at a couple of other people as well. And I submitted it. And about two weeks later, they called up and they said, can you submit a budget? And about a week later, I submitted a budget. And shortly after that, they said, we'd like you to do an hour-long 30 for 30 on the spirits of St. Louis. Well, okay, so... Uh, why, uh, why were you approached uh, about the ABA? There must have been some knowledge out there in basketball and sports land from your past experiences that you had some experience or knowledge of the ABA, no? Uh, not really. Huh. Uh, not really. Uh, I had done a prior film, a documentary called Second Chance Season, about a young man named Nick Young. 
and his uh, senior year of high school. Uh, he had thought that he had a senior year of high school coming uh, and was told uh, that uh, he had, was mistaken, that he had completed four years of high school, uh, and uh, what he thought was his junior year was actually his senior year. Uh, and then uh, three weeks before uh, school started, uh, the principal went to the school board and explained that while he had attended or been enrolled in four years of high school, he had only attended three uh, because his freshman year, he uh, could not attend the school with members of the gang that had murdered his, his brother. And so he was given a second chance at his senior year. And we followed uh, Nick Young through his senior year and through three years at uh, USC and his rivalry with a uh, uh, crosstown uh, friend uh, named Jordan Farmar, uh, who went to UCLA. <clears throat> and we uh, produced a film called Second Chance Season, which... Um, was purchased by ESPN Films. Few people are aware that uh, they had a 30 for 30 year at ESPN, and then uh, they wanted to continue doing uh, documentaries. Uh, and so they said, well, you know, it's no longer our 30th anniversary, so we're just going to call it ESPN Films Presents. So they then did uh, a year or so of, of documentaries under the banner ESPN Films, but everybody kept calling them 30 for 30s. And uh, no matter how much they tried, everybody kept calling them 30 for 30. So they just threw in the towel and said, okay, it's not our 30th anniversary anymore, but we're going to stick with the branding, and it's uh, thir uh, 30 for 30. So uh, Free Spirits was actually my second documentary for ESPN, and they had known uh, about the first one, and they had purchased it, and uh, they enjoyed it very much. All right. Well, this is a good time to take a quick uh, pause and rewind for a quick second because uh – as our audience knows through the intro, which you have yet to hear, but you will have, uh, have played out by now, uh, you have a, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, career, an Emmy award-winning multiple times career uh, in, uh, let's call it primetime television, but also uh, in sports, right? A longtime CBS sports producer for dozens of events and, you know, a producer, a writer, a director. So, you know, uh, you obviously come with a, a, a pretty significant pedigree besides that one uh, that, uh, that first documentary for ESPN, of course. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I've been very, very fortunate and been blessed with tremendous opportunities and the chance to work with some remarkable people. Well, okay. So that out of the way and, uh, and the, uh, the bow to your, uh, to your prowess as in career. Um, so your assignment is the St. Louis spirits. Um, where do you even begin? Uh, to <laughs> walk us through a little bit of the process about a processing the spirits and what you may or may not have known about them. And then B, the process of actually putting together a film such as this? The, um, I started by doing some online research uh, and going through the story. And an invaluable resource uh, was a book called, uh, 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 I guess it was, uh, it was Terry Pluto's book. It's called um, Loose Balls, and it is uh, sitting right here on my here desk, um, staring me in the face, the original 1990 copy, signed and autographed by the author. Yes, know it well. Wonderful. Uh, uh, he was the contrarian in the film, and he was fantastic. He was. Uh, because he was so candid and honest about his opinions, and he was one of the few people who does not love Marvin Barnes. But as I read his book and I did my research, it became evident very early on that the story of the uh, Spirits of St. Louis um, is actually the story of Marvin Barnes. You know, he was a three-ring circle, a circus, and uh, he was the, uh, you know, the circus master. He was the, the the one in charge. Everything revolved around him. So then I uh, I uh, tried to get an appointment with him, and I flew back, and I was told adamantly uh, by a gentleman named Mike Carey, who uh, was his biographer, that there's no way in the world he's going to do this. <laughs> and Mike Mike at the time thought that uh, doing a documentary on these uh, spirits, and including. Mormon was going to hurt his button, which he had not sold yet. Um, over a period of time, I started to, to become friends with Mike, and he began to realize that it wasn't going to hurt his book. It was going to help his book. Um, and then uh, gradually, uh, with uh, Mike's blessing, Marvin came on board um, and agreed to be a part of it. Um, and once Marvin was on board, I knew we had the uh, linchpin to the story. And then we went around, uh, you know, seeing who else we could get. And for the most part, uh, everybody wanted to participate. It was not hard. Uh, even the owners at that time uh, wanted to participate, Dan and Ozzy Silna. Sure. Uh, and so, we, yeah, this was going to be a piece of cake. And so uh, we start lining up the interviews, and about two weeks into production, I get a call from Dan, extremely apologetic, and he says, our attorneys won't let us be interviewed. 
And I said, uh, excuse me? Uh, you know, we've gone forward. They've greenlit it. We've got a budget. We're ready to go. He goes, we've got a little something going on, which you'll hear about shortly, but, you know, don't count on us to participate, but we would love to. And uh, I said, okay. So can you tell me what it is? <laughs> he said, you'll read about it. And lo and behold, three days later, there was an announcement uh, that the owners of the uh, Spirits of St. Louis were suing the NBA for close to a billion dollars for uh, rights uh, that they had to uh, television rights and other new media that they had not been paid for. And until that court case was settled, they could not participate in the documentary. And, and, so, we'll, we'll, and we'll get to that sort of seminal event because that, that deal <laughs> obviously was, was a huge – was a huge issue, yes. but but this you're, so but the movie on ESPN for you uh, debuted in, in um, October of 2013, right? And and I right. guess we after, started we started in uh, 2012, right? And but after that, though, I think the year after, I guess, is when the Silnas actually I don't call it a settlement, but it seems like they uh, came to some kind of uh, long term sort of terminal agreement of a big lump sum that kind of ended the entire perpetuity thing, right? There there there, there was a settlement. And believe it or not, it is still going on, and there is a small fraction of payments which continue to be in perpetuity. Um, you know, most of it is done, and most of it is uh, was settled, and they wanted to do that for their heirs, uh, which was done. And once uh, it had settled, I think one of the first phone calls that Dan Silva made was to me, and he says, hey, we can talk. And I went back to ESPN and said, uh, they can talk. What do you want to do? And they said, let's update the documentary. So there are actually two versions of uh, Free Spirits out there, one without the Silnas, and a second one which we did at a reunion that they had for the team where we interviewed them and a few of the players again after the settlement to update it. And, uh, and that's the part with the, uh, the cap at the end of the movie. Uh, that uh, you, you, you remember what the inscription on the back of those caps were? In, in, uh, uh, in spirit, in perpetuity. Which is the irony. Okay, well, since we did bring it up, and, and argu arguably that is sort of the final chapter, but we can work our way back. Um, do you want to <laughs> do you want to do you want to uh, walk our listeners through? And I would imagine most of our listeners to this sort of niche of sports history will probably already know the the, the bare bones of the story. But for those an uninitiated, do you you want to sort of give a little uh, encapsula encapsulation of what was arguably the sports deal of the I don't know, millennium? Well, here's uh, the, it, it really has to deal not with the spirits, but with what people call the merger between the NBA and the ABA. Sure. Uh, the uh, ABA had shrunk down, I think, from 13 teams to seven teams um, at the beginning of uh, 1975. Uh, and the, Silnas, the sole reason for them getting involved in the ABA, and they only owned the spirits for two years, was they had seen the merger between the NFL and the AFL, and they thought this was an opportunity to get a basketball team and merge with the NBA. So that was their goal. At the beginning of the year, when the league started to fall apart, they realized that, you know what, it, it's unlikely that the uh, NBA is going to take seven teams. They thought they would probably take six teams, and that one team would be left out. So they came up with a formula. They were very, very ethical, uh, rather religious uh, Jews who were uh, in the schmata or the clothing business from yeah. Jersey. There was uh, sons of immigrants. Uh, and so they wanted to be fair, and they wanted to be fair to the one owner who was going to be left out. And they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them some money. And since there are seven teams in it right now, every team will contribute one-seventh of their television revenues to the team that isn't allowed to join. And this was their plan. And they never in their wildest dreams thought that they would not be allowed to join. They were certain because they ran such a good franchise in their mind that they would be allowed to join the NBA. Well, at the end of the season, um, uh, one of the teams dropped out. There were six teams left. And now the Sonos were feeling pretty good, and they were going to take care of the one team that dropped out. Um, <clears throat> and the NBA uh, wanted to uh, take uh, uh, four teams, not six. Their television contract said they would get more money if they took a minimum of four teams. Uh, and so the NBA said, what do we need six for? We'll just do four. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what they did uh, at that time was they went through the four. They took uh, Denver. Uh, they took San Antonio, they took Indiana, uh, and they took the New York Nets. And so suddenly, Kentucky Colonels, John White Brown, was out, 
and he settled uh, uh, for about $3.2 million. When I say settled, it isn't with the NBA. The NBA mm-hmm. told the ABA, get your, uh, your case in order, get rid of all the people, uh, all the teams that uh, aren't with you anymore, settle with them, and then come to us, and we will take you in. And so what was left was the Spirits of St. Louis, and the other teams offered them money. They didn't want money. Uh, uh, they wanted to be part of the NBA, and they kept begging to be part of the NBA. And they figured as long as they had some attachment to the NBA, they would be okay. And what they uh, what fell back on was this, this idea that they had for the 17, they applied to themselves. And it was that, hey, we'll take a little bit of money, I think it was $2.1 million, but we want one-seventh of the TV, re- TV revenue of all four teams that went in. And the teams at that time weren't really in the, there was no TV revenue. They were prohibited from taking any for three years. And at the time, it was a small contract. It didn't amount to anything. Uh, but they were still reluctant to do it. And Donald Chupak, who was one of the a minority owner, but also the attorney, what he did was he took all of the other teams on a hot August week in New York, and he brought them to their office. And he wouldn't let them leave until they agreed to these terms. And I think he kept them there three or four days and was uh, you know, sweating. He turned off the air conditioning, opened the windows. He was running around, and he tells the story in gym shorts and a T-shirt. And they're sitting around in suits and trying to negotiate this. And so finally they agreed. And at the time, again, it was nothing. So they went away, and they thought, okay, we've got a little something to keep us with the NBA. If they expand again, they'll come back to us. Well, over the years, uh, that little bit, that one-seventh or four-seventh from the four teams, uh, ended up being worth tens of millions of dollars uh, and then hundreds of millions of dollars. And then eventually, when they won their lawsuit, uh, a half a billion dollars. And they, it was basically they were the um, extra owners in the NBA. And they, uh, there were times during the, uh, the, over the decades where they tried to get teams. They tried to buy the New York Nets. Uh, and um, one of the agreements that the NBA demanded was that they give up their settlement uh, on the TV revenue. They refused. They were not allowed in. And, and that's interesting because uh, you, you elicit a couple of opinions there that, that uh, during the film, I think, I think uh, Bob Costas in particular said uh, it was his, his opinion that, that Dan and Ozzy would have been early on satisfied with, with simply getting a franchise. Well, that's all uh, they wanted. All they wanted the day they died, all they wanted, all the day that Ozzy died, Dan is still with us, uh, that's all they wanted was to be part of it. And, and ironically, um, uh, the commissioner was on their side and worked very hard. He liked them, and he wanted them. Uh, David Stern liked them and wanted to try and get a team. And on two or three occasions, he tried to be the mediator, and other owners with the you know still uh, you know hurt feelings from all these years uh, said no. But the reasons why, though, it it seems fairly clear, certainly through the movie, but I guess in other research as well, that you know St. Louis for some reason never really uh, took as a professional basketball. Uh, town, right? I mean, you had a pro, you had a pro NBA team that came and left and went to went to Atlanta, uh, and then St. Louis Spirits did not do very well. You have a couple of great still shots in the, in the film, uh, Free Spirits on ESPN and and on DVD. We'll, we'll tell you about where else to get it later. Uh, where just a, a completely barren, uh, empty uh, St. Louis arena. Right. They. Um uh, they won the NBA championship uh, a few years before the Spirits got there, uh, and uh, they had a little bit of a following. But you know, face it, uh, you know, uh, St. Louis is a baseball town first and a hockey town second. So, moving on then to to Mr. Barnes, right? So, huh. how did how did, once you were able to get him to say yes? Um, mm-hmm. How did you kind of back into his story, the sort of uh, quixotic nature of his personality, but then obviously the tragic components of it as well? How do you how do you delicately approach a subject like that that you know will be complex and have highs and lows as an interview subject? Uh, with Marvin, it, it, there's no delicate. Uh, you just have a conversation. He is a performer at heart. He loved telling his story. He loved telling the high points and bragging about how he would score 50 points a game with his eyes closed and the low points about how his goal in life was to be a pimp and a drug dealer and to live fast and die young. And he told them with uh, equal exuberance uh, and uh, no apologies. I think many people regard him 
before his well his drug problems and, and whatnot is is arguably one of the greatest shall we say wasted or lost talents in basketball history in this country. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, it, it is almost as if the game was too easy for him, and so that he could turn it on when he wanted, uh, and just demolish people, and then he'd get bored, and uh, you know uh, he played very lackadaisical, and it would be embarrassment. I mean, there were times where you know he was benched just for not, not just not listening to the coach, not paying attention to anything going on uh, going out on the court. Well, do you do you think he was enabled? Um, because it's pretty clear that that the the owners and and the the management tried to pretty much build, you know, kind of the the team around his uh, his his prowess on the, on right. the basketball court, but also his personality, I guess, too, to a certain extent. Yeah, he had an enabler. The enabler's name was Fly Williams. Hmm. Um, Fly was a uh, Harlem playground legend, uh, you know, from uh, Austin P. Um, and uh, when he got there, uh, he introduced Marvin uh, to uh, street drugs. Uh, and Marvin liked it, liked it very, very much. There's a uh, one of my favorite stories from the documentary. Uh, in doing the interviews, is we sat down with Fly, and he said, um, "You know, uh, we, here's what I did my first year on the team, and here's what I did, you know, second season." And I said, "Fly, you know, wait a second. You weren't on the team second season. You were cut in training camp because you didn't get along with the coach." He goes, "Oh, I was on the team second season." Said you were on the team. I said you traveled with the team. He goes, yeah, well, yeah, I traveled to every game. I said you traveled to every. I said you weren't on the team. He cut you. I said what position were you? He goes, oh, I was the team pusher. And he then explained how for that entire second season, his job was to pick up drugs in New York, bring them back to St. Louis for home games, and then travel with the team to away games. And he would arrange the party after the games, and not just for the spirits of St. Louis, but whatever team they were playing. All the parties, uh, all the uh, members uh, who were in t- inclined to do so, would get together with hookers and drugs and alcohol after the game, and party until late into the hours. And then the next morning, they'd get up and they'd go on to the next city. Um, and he was the one who introduced uh, Marvin. Marvin had the money, so Marvin then bought a uh, an apartment in in St. Louis, strictly for uh, going and doing drugs and having hookers. I mean, that's, that's, that's stunning stuff. And, and, and you also uh, have a bit of, of, of story in the, in the film, too, about uh, Gus Gerard, another quality player that got ensnared, I guess, into sort of the drug habit and right. culture as well. It, it, if Fly was Marvin's enabler, Marvin was Gus's enabler. He was the one who introduced him. They liked to smoke pot a lot together, and it had some dire consequences for Gus, uh, who made a lot of money. Uh, but in the end, the drugs took over. He lost uh, all of his money. He lost his family. He tried to asphyxiate himself by uh, parking his car in a garage and running it. Um, but uh, before he died, and before the fumes killed him, the car ran out of gas. So he just passed out and was found uh, there. I think it was by his sister. I'm not certain of that. Uh, and survived and gradually put his life back together to the point where today he is now a drug counselor helping other people. Well, lest our audience think that that was all sort of uh, sad and maudlin, and obviously these are tragic stories that are clearly life-changing and, 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 and cr- clearly some silver linings uh, coming out of that. Uh, you have some great quotes in there. Uh, I mean, Dr. J, I think, uh, kind of summed it up. He basically kind of said that uh, Marvin Barnes, and then I guess a little bit to, to the uh, to the franchise itself, especially in the second year with all that talent, that you know that pretty much the the spirits kind of had, and Barnes in particular had as much talent as anybody out there, maybe even more so, but were just essentially self destructive. Uh, do you think that's yeah. that's a fair assessment to the team? Uh, Certainly, uh, for Marvin, absolutely fair assessment. Um, uh, they had basically an all star team. Uh, their second year when things fell apart. Um, but uh, Dr. Jane knows uh, personally from the first year, uh, the Nets had, were defending champions, had beaten uh, the Spirits 11 times in a row, and then the first game of the first round of the playoffs. And then uh, Marvin and Fly uh, and Maurice Lucas, they went on a tear, and they uh, won the last uh, four games in a row. Uh, both at home and on the road, uh, and upset the defending champions uh, in what is considered by many to be one of the greatest upsets in professional basketball history. Um, and in the film, uh, Free Spirits, there's a, a great uh, 
setup there. You've got uh, the, uh, the the actual film. Which so where did the where did the game footage come from? And did you take that game footage and then splice in Costas's uh, radio broadcast, or was that all part of one solo sole broadcast? Uh, Roger uh, Holstein was. Uh Bob Costas, his roommate at Syracuse University, he was the one who helped him get his first job, which was as announcer for the Spirits. Roger had a connection to the owners, um, and that this was a little incestuous, but he brought Bob in, and Bob uh, was the announcer. Roger had one 20-minute highlight uh, VHS of that season. On that tape were the highlights, including Bob's uh, call. Uh, which was, if for me, the highlight of the uh, uh, of the up part of the film. Sure, uh, it, it was just wonderful. And Bob, for him, he loved working on the film because it allowed him to share with his children his early beginnings. Uh, but yeah, it, we had one twenty minute tape. I sent uh, Jason Keeley, our associate producer, to St. Louis for ten days to scour the historical society, every uh, local TV station, every radio station. Uh, to see what we could find, and he came back with, I would say, probably about uh, 40 minutes of footage, and we made that work for the entire film. So help our audience out a bit, because obviously we we spend a lot of time, and we'll continue to spend a lot of time working towards uh, getting uh, more insight into these various documentaries and and, and whatnot about teams and leagues and whatnot. How, I mean, just how, if you can explain how enormously difficult, I'm assuming, it is to get, not only find that great footage and, and then be able to use it and put it together, but then also clear it uh, for legal rights and, and the costs of such. It's pretty daunting, isn't I it? Wish, I wish I could tell you that it is daunting and hard. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a legal loophole uh, which you can use, and it's called fair use. Fair use basically says that, you, that I have every right to tell a story, and I should make every effort to find and clear footage. Uh, with the owners and pay them for that footage. However, if there is footage that I cannot clear or cannot pay for, or somebody doesn't want to give me, what I'm able to do is turn it over to a specialized attorney called a fair use attorney. He looks at it and says, this story cannot be told without that footage. You have every right to use it in order to tell the story. So in every film that I do, there is some footage that we declare, we send to the attorney, and he says, yes, you need this to tell the story. It's fair use. And so ideally, you do go out, you find it, you, you purchase it, you get the, all the rights you need, and we do that for 90% of the material. But if you get in a jam, you can lean back on fair use, and you have a legal right to do that. Music, however, a little bit more nettlesome. Believe it or not, you can do the same thing for music. Interesting. If you, if you, you try to get it. Uh, I just ran into this um, actually earlier today. Uh, for a documentary we're currently doing that will premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival called Mike and the Mad Dog about the two gentlemen who uh, are credited with starting contemporary sports talk radio. Uh, in, uh, in that, we have uh, Chris Russo, one of the two sports uh, talk hosts, singing for all of two seconds. And God help me, he's singing a Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> and um, I could not afford to use that. But it's him singing, uh, covering a, a song at a rally that they were doing. And so we sent it over to the attorney, and the attorney looked at it, and he said, yeah, this is about Chris singing. It's not about the song. And he declared it fair use. So we are okay with that. Um, you know, uh, I don't think that uh, anybody would complain about it, but we want to be on safe ground, so that's what we have done. We would not use it if we didn't have that declared. Every other bit of music that is in it uh, for the hour is cleared and registered, and everything is fine with it. And since you brought it up, let us take this uh, quick promotional pause here to indeed remind uh, folks that Mike and the Mad Dog is world premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, we are uh, going to drop this episode uh, to the world on the, the 17th of April, but uh, you will be making that grand debut on Friday, uh, April 21st in New York City at the Tribeca Film Festival. It's called Mike and the Mad Dog. Anybody who grew up in New York and has listened to either Mike Francesa or Chris Mad Dog Russo uh, will uh, uh, be like a moth to a flame uh, to this film. I have not seen it, but I'm sure that I will uh, – relish it and devour it when it comes out and I can actually access it uh, myself. We have five screenings, we have five screenings over the week uh, in New York and then it, I'm told that it will most likely premiere on ESPN uh, July 17th. 
So there you go. If you're hearing this between now and then, um, keep, uh, keep your DVRs uh, set for Mike and the Mad Dog coming up this summer sometime in July, we think, on yeah, the if, various Yeah, if anybody ESPN enjoys platforms. Sports Talk Radio even a little bit, uh, I think they will enjoy this film. It okay. uh, talks about how Sports Talk uh, uh, got big in the uh, 90s and uh, early 2000s and focuses on the stellar careers of two gentlemen um, who are unique personalities, uh, and they had a relationship that was very tumultuous um, and very rewarding uh, for about 19 years. Indeed, and uh, I will not regale you with my um, Mad Dog Russo uh, imitation, which is actually pretty good, I'm told, uh, but usually in bar settings. Um, <laughs> so let's let's get uh, 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 as we kind of maybe sort of uh, uh, try to put a, a coup de gras here, I guess, or a cap here on the on the spirits story. What uh, in the process of making this film and the various people that you interviewed? I mean, you know, again, uh, Bob Costas, you know, his first real professional gig. Um, you know, you've got uh, Brent Musburger in there with a couple of great quotes. Obviously, Steve Snapper Jones. Uh, you know, um, did you learn anything new that you didn't know about the story? Uh, and frankly, some of the people involved were they challenging? Uh, intriguing things, uh, different sides of people that you didn't really know about, uh, any sort of revelations in the process? Uh, no major rev revelations. What you learn always doing this is that, you know, you do your research and you, uh, you know the stories that you want them to talk about. But when you ask three different people to tell you about the story, you get three different versions of the story. Uh, and then when you remind them what somebody else said, oh, yeah, and it kind of snowballs a little and builds a little. And one of the things that I enjoy is watching the people we interview reminisce about those stories. Um, you know, uh, hearing them uh, take the, the, the different uh, uh, tacks. You know, Marvin uh, saw himself as a young Muhammad Ali, and he wanted to be a poet. So, you know, he wrote that poem, you know, there once was a doctor named Irving whose slam dunks were especially unnerving, but when Marvin gets moving and the crowd gets to grooving, for the doctor a hospital they'll be reserving. You know, and, and he, he, he tried really hard to get everybody on board. When we asked people, was he Ali? Some people would say, yeah, kind of a little bit. And other people would just laugh hysterically and say he was the furthest thing from Ali. You know, and so hearing the different sides of the different stories were, um, were really, really nice. And then sitting in another room and blending them so you can pick the most entertain, entertaining version uh, of it is, is always fun. Um, there were a couple of people uh, that uh, we interviewed who uh, always after, after they're done have second thoughts about things they say. Um, and um, Can they come to mind? Uh, yeah, well, uh, everything was really positive. The only negative in doing Free Spirits was we had an incident uh, with Rod Thorne. Rod Thorne had gotten into it with Fly Williams. He was the coach who uh, dismissed him from the team during uh, 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 before the season started. And after the interview, Rod Thorne uh, declined to sign uh, his release. And uh, I always ask for a verbal release before we start an interview so they know why they're doing it and they're giving us permission to use it. And so afterwards, he, went, he uh, declined to sign the release. He was concerned that he would come out looking bad but with some of the criticisms that he had uh, fly. Uh, but when we put it in and he saw it, he was okay with it. So uh, in, in, the, in telling the entire spirit story, I mean, how much do you think of a microcosm that team was for the entire league? I mean, you said you grew up uh, or went to earlier on uh, the Amigos games and LA Stars games. I mean, were, were the Stars, excuse me, were the spirits somewhat unique in their own sort of way, or was it emblematic of a wild and woolly time in, in, in that league? They were the ABA on steroids. Everything that was the ABA, you had in the spirits. But it was a little bigger, a little louder. The promotions they did a little crazier. You know, ironically, they didn't draw any fans. But the one night that they could draw fans was ball night, but they didn't have enough balls. And so they had 2,000 fans who didn't get ABA red, white, and blue balls. And there was a small right, and they had to call the police in to calm things down. Um, so, yeah, er everything. The drugs, uh, the, uh, the hookers, uh, the crazy play. Uh, the feuds, the partying, uh, that was all part of the ABA, but it seems like the spirits did it a little bolder than everybody else. Well, look, it's a fascinating story, and, and if anybody needs a, uh, a primer on the American Basketball Association, uh, you could do worse than to um, uh, see the movie Free Spirits, which, again, came out in 2013. 
on ESPN. I, I know that they replay it on a uh, an ongoing and regular basis, and obviously it's available in digital form and DVD form. And um, and and Dan Forer, you've been terrific uh, as a guest, to telling us about uh, the story, the the whole uh, the legacy of the team and the league, but also your uh, your adjunct into it and how you made it, and um, and maybe perhaps a few few lessons learned from the process. Um, any other projects besides the uh, the huge spotlight of Mike and the Mad Dog for the next couple of months that you have on your uh, on your horizon, uh, particularly in sports? No, we we have uh, two projects that I'm uh, currently working on. Uh, one has to do with uh, NASCAR in the uh, late 1960s. Um, an incident that occurred there uh, where uh, some aerospace engineers got involved for one year and changed the sport and then were banned from the sport. Uh, and then another one involving um, uh, the uh, University of Memphis uh, basketball team in the early 70s uh, and the impact that they had on the city uh, following the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. Very interesting. Uh, on the NASCAR one, um, is that the uh, Dodge Dart spoiler issue? Uh, that would be it. That's, fan- that's fantastic, and I think that's that'll be a very interesting story. Any, any interesting stories learned there, or you want to save it for the film? Uh, well, uh, what's fascinating about that is I originally wrote it up as a documentary proposal, uh, but when I was done, I looked at it and I said, this is actually a feature film, and so uh, it was shopped around Hollywood a little bit, and there's a uh, A-list star uh, who saw it and liked it, and if NASCAR will sign off on it, uh, we will hopefully uh, go into development on a feature film, not a documentary on that story. That's fantastic. Well, we wish you luck with that project and all of your others to come, and especially we wish you a tremendous success with uh, Mike and the Mad Dog coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, both uh, in in the uh, film festival circuit as well as on television later this summer. So thank you, Dan, for very much for your um, your time and, um, frankly, more importantly, your film, uh, Free Spirits. Uh, uh, thank you very story. much. I enjoyed it. I wish Bye. you the best of luck with your podcast. Uh, it's a wonderful topic to cover, and uh, I think you're going to have some tremendous uh, podcasts coming up. Uh, I look forward to listening to them. Thanks so much, Dan. Okay, there you have it. A uh, great conversation. Thank you to Dan Forer for it. Uh, and again, the movies, uh, plural, uh, are Free Spirits, um, which is an ESPN 30 for 30 documentary uh, that uh, continues to sort of run out there in uh, the ESPN platform land. So keep an eye out for that. It's also available digitally or DVD. You can find a link to all that stuff on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, and also uh, keep an eye out for the premiere on television, we believe sometime in the middle of July, of Dan's current film, or new film, called Mike and the Mad Dog, the story behind Mike Francesa and Chris Mad Dog Russo and WFAN Sports Talk Radio and the genre of sports talk radio that uh, arguably they were um, responsible for uh, catalyzing uh, and continue to pioneer with uh, today. Um, my thanks again to Dan Four for the conversation, and my thanks again to you, the listener, for putting us in your earbuds and for uh, giving us uh, a spin. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you online. We'll see you on our uh, various social feeds, and uh, we've got lots of great stuff coming up. Again, our thanks for listening, and uh, more to come. Take care, everybody.